Hello YouTube, this is RPM1200. I have here an Ironrite Model 85 automatic ironer, aka Mangle. I did some repairs on this last night and I want to kind of walk through what I did in case it would be helpful to anybody else who's going to work on one of these machines. First off, I replaced the power cord. You can see here this is one of those old 50s style or 40s style iron power cords. It's uh, got rubber insulation, fabric covering. You can kind of feel it's crispy in places, so the insulation is clearly failing. In addition, you've got a very large metal appliance here. It really should be connected with a three-prong plug. So what I did was I got one of these replacement cords from uh, Home Depot, just really straightforward, 14 gauge, so it can handle the current that this thing's gonna pull. Remember, it's an iron, so it's got quite a sizable heating element in it, and you want to make sure that whatever cord you're going to use can handle the current capacity that it needs. And also you can see it's a three-prong plug. What you have to do in order to replace the cord in this thing is you have to remove the top. And so what I've done here is I've got just a Rubbermaid bin with a bunch of stuff stacked on top of it, so it's the same height that the, uh, the top of the ironer will just sit right on top of it when it's opened. Let's just go ahead and do that. One resource online said that you can use an office chair with an adjustable height. That would be a great solution for this. I just didn't happen to have one available. So I've already replaced the screws. Three of them came out very easily in the fourth. Thankfully I wasn't I was able to pull it out without completely rounding it off. You can see these are the original screws that were in there. You need a gigantic flat blade screwdriver and in addition on one of them I had to apply some heat, uh, multiple applications of PB Blaster and then even hitting it with a hammer a little bit before it would free up and I was able to take it out. I figure these hex cap screws are going to be a better solution because there's not the risk of rounding them off like there is with this. So what I ended up using was Home Depot had these uh, button head socket cap screws, quarter 28 by half inch. They're the correct thread pitch and the correct length. Um, the heads are smaller though, so I ended up just getting some plain quarter inch stainless washers to go in there. And then you can see they pretty much fit perfectly and we shouldn't have any trouble with them uh, being hard to remove in the future. But anyway, what you would do is you would take, uh, once you've got your, your top supported here by the, the stuff that I piled up behind it, you would remove the four screws and then you can just wheel the ironer away from its top. The reason that you're doing this is, I'll show you here, around here you've got, so what we have here is this is the access plate that you're going to need to, to access. And there's just the two flathead screws holding it in place. It just lifts out of the bottom. Now you can see what we've got is a terminal strip. There's three sections to it. The bottom two are the ones that have your connections. Uh, because this originally had a non-polarized plug, it's not super critical which is which. Um, and you can see they're just normal flathead screw connections. The top one is for the motor. You don't want to connect to that. So what's happening is the power goes from this back part of the ironer to the front where the motor switches, and then this top one has the switched motor power. Um, and then you can see kind of in the corner there, I've just got my ground wire. All I did was I just stuck the ground wire under one of the retaining screws for this. I just kind of threaded it in there. I got to get the bottom in before I, before I try to do the top get this in here so it's got a good ground connection and then just line it up with the screw hole. And 
What I did was, uh, after I removed the original cord, I just wrapped um, a couple zip ties around the cord as sort of a simple strain relief. I made sure they were nice and tight. And then I put another one on the back so that it couldn't be fed back through. Just have to run the, the cord through this one hole here and then also the, the hole right below the junction box. In my case, I had taken this plate off. It gets a little oil inside it, so be careful when you take it off. That just made it easier to fish the cord through and not having a good strain relief underneath the terminal strip. I also used a couple zip ties just to make sure that it can't move back and forth. The original cord just had a little spring-loaded washer on it to do the same thing. So anyway, once you've got it, get your power cord replaced if, if you need to. Open it up. There we go. This is what it looks like completely open. Alright, so we're going to go ahead and plug it in, check out the operation. First make sure the motor starts. And this is normal, the clutches are all out, so you're not going to get any motion, but you should hear the motor running. And then the other thing we can check is, this pilot light indicates that the heat is on. Now I checked this yesterday and it was working fine, so I'm not going to go through all that again. But I'd like to talk about the uh, lubricating oil that this device needs. So if this is sat idle for any period of time, or if it's been used for uh, two to three years, the recommendation is that you change the oil in the system. So there's two parts to be concerned with here. The first is this is a cover that covers the clutch gear assembly and everything. And then in back, there is one Phillips head screw. The other thing to be concerned with is the drain system here. This is a drain plug. So to remove the drain plug, you want a 9 16ths ratchet or wrench. And then once you've got that, you need something to catch the used oil. So what I did was I just took an old OxyClean bottle, I kind of cut a hole into it, and I cut the top off of it and just kind of duct taped over where the top was. The idea is that whatever you come up with needs to fit under the drain hole, but at the same time it needs to be able to receive about 6 ounces of liquid. Since I've already changed the oil here, I'm not going to go through the process again, but you get the idea. I've heard a number of different recommendations for what kind of oil to use. I ended up going with some 10W40. I've heard also that you could use 3-in-1, although I wasn't able to find that in a large quantity. And another option is SAE50 oil. But in my case, I've got 10W40 in there, and I ended up buying a dollar store container that had ounce markings on it, so I just marked it for five ounces and uh, filled it up. So to remove the cover of the gearbox and clutch assembly, just find your Phillips head screw. Just remove that. And then I'll show you how this works. You, what I like to do is I just kind of grab it from this part on the back and slide it forward a little bit and then pop it out. So you can see a couple things going on. One is there's a set of springs on, on this unit. That's why it doesn't just lift straight out. It, there's a little bit of tension holding it in place. And you can see how you want to slide it back. You want to pop the top out and then slide it back. Something else to point out here. So you can see there's a gasket here. If this gasket goes bad, you're going to end up with oil leaks. You can get a make your own gasket kit at an uh, auto supply store. Here's a better view of the gearbox. The way it works is that we've got a couple of knee controls down here. So the knee control on the left will pause the roller without lifting it. The knee control on the right operates a cam that lifts or drops the roller. When it drops down, it starts rolling. I'll show you what it looks like when it's running. I'll start it up. So now you can see that the gear on the left is operated by the motor and that's just running continually. This uh, push to release, this is sort of an emergency release. If this were to stall while you're ironing, 
you're going to scorch your material. The normal position that it's in is this position that you see right now. This is this is the release position, so you can see you get a lot more distance between the uh, the ironing roll and the, the heel. And then this is the normal position. That noise it makes is perfectly normal. And you can kind of cheat it a little bit. If you pull this, you kind of bypass the cam system and start the roller operating. But that isn't how this is meant to be used. That's just, like I said, a cheat. Let that go, and you can see it immediately stops. The way it's supposed to work is that when this knee lever is pushed, cam goes into place, it drops the roller down, and the roller starts rotating. Push the button again, and the roller lifts up and is no longer rotating. Can I get a close-up of the gearbox? All right, here we go. I'm going to operate the knee lever. I'm going to operate it again. In my case, and apparently this is a very common failure with these units, there are these two keys that go into that gear that's rotating. The keys should only operate when the knee lever is pressed. But what happens is when these are put into storage with old oil, the oil kind of congeals around the keys and it prevents them from popping out and meshing with that gear. So what happens is that the cam never rotates. Without the cam rotating, you're not going to get the roller dropping into place and, and rotating. The whole purpose of the cam is to apply pressure to the roll and to engage it with the clutch so that it can rotate. So, I'm not sure if I'll be able to show exactly what I did, but let's turn this off for safety. And so, if I can uh, try to indicate here, this unit right here, this entire right side will rotate when it engages. And this part right here, is connected to the left knee lever. And let me, let me show the operation of that also. So I'm gonna turn the motor back on, operate the right knee lever. And also, by the way, don't hold the right knee lever. It's strictly an on-off operation. So just tap it once until your roller starts dropping and rotating, and then you're good to go. Um, your left knee lever, on the other hand, is one that you hold in order to operate it. When you hold it, it stops the roller from rotating, and as soon as you release it, the roller takes off again. And that's so that you can pause and add a little bit of extra heat when needed when ironing garments. I'm going to push that left lever again, and you can see that that, that piece is dropping down. Well, the right lever is underneath that metal. It's very hard to see. Everything is kind of tight inside this gearbox. If you look at the metal plate that is under what I'm pointing to, not, not this part, but just under that. Underneath that is where the rod is that comes from the right knee control. It, I don't think I can get a view with this camera of what's happening. I had to look at it for quite a while to see where the rod was, but it's down there, it's just under that metal piece. But anyway, that I'm not sure if we can get a view of the action here, but let's see if we can. So you see how the cam, I pushed the knee switch and the cam rotated. What's happening is the two keys are coming out to the left as you look at it right now and engaging with that spinning gear. I'm gonna do it again. It should happen again. Do it again. Unfortunately, you can't really see the keys, and even looking at the service manual, I had a hard time finding the keys, but let's, uh, let's turn this off, all the way off. Okay. But anyway, what I had to do was, I had originally done an oil change, and then I found that the right lever was just doing nothing. So that is the main symptom, is uh, you're... You can pull on, on this piece and the, 
the roll will rotate, but if you push the right knee lever, nothing happens. As I said, I was able to shine a flashlight down in here and see where the lever was poking up, but it wasn't doing anything. So if you're in that situation that I was in, where you can look inside it, you shine a flashlight down, you can see something moving when you push the knee switch, but nothing's happening. What that means is that this part, right here down below, there's a spring. That spring puts tension on the keys and um, enables them to, to pop back out of place uh, when the cam is not being activated. And of course, that's the normal state. And that's the state that it gets frozen in when the oil goes bad. So that's why the keys are just fused to the cam when you get into this situation that prevents it from operating. There's nothing that engages this gear to move the cam. There are two keys, one on either side. They're more or less horizontally aligned. This one is, you can see that this is part of the key, the part that I'm pointing to with my screwdriver. It goes through this cam and then the other end meshes with this gear here. There's another similar one on this side, but it's much harder to get to. I squirted a lot of WD-40 and PB Blaster onto this part right about here where my screwdriver is. Um, there's a notch and I was able to kind of get a flathead screwdriver in there and push it back and forth until it was free. And when it's free, you should see when you push on the key, you should see that spring moving a little bit and then moving it back. So you push it over to the right, it comes back because of the spring. I had it at one point I had the close side freed and I couldn't get the far side. Eventually with enough PB blaster and just levering on it with the power off and with a uh, flathead screwdriver and the little notch. The notch is more or less located right here in where my the tip of the screwdriver is. Very, very hard to see. But anyway, you get that set of keys. As I said, one on the close side, one on the far side. You get those free and the system will be operating as normal. Now, after I shot a bunch of WD-40 and PB Blaster into this thing, I changed the oil again because I didn't want to use the oil that was contaminated with all that stuff. Maybe it wouldn't have done any harm. I don't want to take the risk and find out. So I just drained the oil a final time and uh, replaced it. Some things I saw online said that you should try to do the best job you can of soaking up the gunky oil at the bottom even after draining it. I just wasn't able to find a good method for doing that. So I figure I've got a couple oil changes and we're probably in good shape. But if it starts acting up again, then um, I can certainly go ahead and do another oil change. Oil changes are so simple. All you have to do to change the oil is uh, you drain it as I showed before by pulling the plug and putting the right kind of container under the hole, wait until everything's out. And then I, I put a little bit of paper towel out under it after pulling the receptacle container out just because it will drip a little bit of oil. Uh, I put the plug back in. Next, put five ounces of whatever kind of oil you'd like to use. As I said, I use 10W40. Um, SA50 is recommended. 3-in-1 is recommended. All you got to do is when you've got your oil in your container, just pour it right over the top. There's no real science to it or anything. It just goes in because basically the parts all kind of go into the oil sump. You do not want to overfill this. Five ounces should be sufficient. You do not want to just fill her up. Um, these parts, uh, there are friction parts in here. There's a clutch. I'm sure if you over oil it, your clutch isn't going to grip anymore. And uh, it's possible you might get to a situation where you're your roller goes up and down but doesn't turn anymore. Once you've got your new oil in and if you've got your keys all freed up, you make sure that your your levers are operating as they should. Um, there are some adjustments too. I actually did a little bit of white lithium grease on the the different pivots for the, the knee adjustments and that freed them up quite a bit. So let's just do it one more time just for fun. All right, here we go, operation. There we are, cam's engaged now. 
Oh, and by the way, if you push the red lever while the cam's engaged, it is super loud. Um, but once again, I think that's the way it's designed. And really, it's just kind of an emergency operation more than anything. And you can see the cam reset when I pulled it back into place. So now it's back in the idle position uh, with the roller, with a gap between the, the roller and the shoe. The heat and motor are completely independent. So if you're just working on the gears, there's no reason to turn the heat on. You do need to use heat when you're replacing the roll cover. That's all documented in the manual, which is available online. And even though they did originally sell roll covers and pads, obviously the company has been out of business for over 50 years. So you kind of got to make your own at this point. But once again, there's instructions online of how to do that. Okay, I'm just gonna go through one more full operation just for the heck of it. So, engage. We are engaged, and now I'm going to run the left lever to pause it. And you can see that what happens is the clutch disengages, which stops the roller. But the pressure cam is still on, so there's still no gap between the roll and the, the heating shoe. So I'm gonna let go. There we go. And we'll just turn it back off. Uh, first, disengage the clutch. There we go, and motor off. Okay, great. Once you've got your gearbox working the way you want, um, all you gotta do is put these two fingers in the front, align them as well as you can. Um, get this more or less centered on the gasket, and then you probably have to apply a little bit of pressure into the, uh, the springs on the back. Don't pinch yourself and just get, send it home there. And then once, it's, once it looks good to you, put that Phillips head screw back in and tighten it down. No need to go crazy with pressure. Should be good to go. Thanks for watching.